Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another one of our Infonetics webinar sessions. I'm Scott Rainovich. I'm the event director with Infonetics. And today we have a great webinar for you. It's, the topic is scaling small cell backhaul. This is, of course, an exciting market, and we're going to learn a, a little bit about the growth in the market and where it's going to come from and what people should look for. We have an excellent panel of speakers. This includes um, Heidi Adams from Alcatel-Lucent, Rand Avatel from Saragon, Martin Nuss from Vitesse Semiconductor, and leading our discussion today, Infinetics Directing Analyst Richard Webb. I'm going to hand it over to Richard. Um, here's the agenda, and Richard's going to guide us through the presentation and tell, tell us what to expect from the small cell market. Richard? Thank you very much, Scott. So I'm going to talk about the market trends before we uh, run through some of the problems and challenges, and then some of the solutions for small cell backhaul. Uh, we'll have a quick look at deployment by service providers of small cell backhaul applications, and then we'll have a run through uh, some of the approaches from our sponsors today to that scenario. And then we'll wrap quickly with some concluding statements before we move on to Q&A. You can submit questions at any time during the uh, webinar today using the Q&A part of the, web, of the ON24 interface. And we'll get to those at the end. But I'm going to start off by uh, setting the context for the discussion. The chart that uh, I've put up is um, one that is taken from an operator survey that Infinetics undertook last year in which we spoke to a sample group of mobile operators regarding their mobile network strategies. Specifically, we asked them how they would handle traffic on their network into 2013. So this was a, a 2012 study. We wanted to understand where they would be placing that traffic in the network. And this was the second year running that we've actually asked this particular question. You can see MacroCell is where 71% 70, of that traffic is going to be in 2013. That actually came down from over 90% in 2012, so already quite a significant shift. What we're also seeing is a significant growth in outdoor small cells um, for 2013, and that's going to increase even more rapidly as we move forward, even though we're seeing very aggressive deployment of carrier Wi-Fi by some mobile operators. And the truth is they may not have a choice because managing data over the macro RAN is just not going to be sustainable given the current level of growth. Operators need an alternative infrastructure. They've got to create a denser network coverage, more cost-effective delivery of capacity, and it's the deployment of those outdoor small cells in particular that we're going to be looking at today. Just moving the slide along. There we are. So what does this backhaul environment look like? Well, these small cells are likely to be deployed predominantly in metro areas and predominantly on street poles or on the side of buildings. And from there, they're going to require connectivity to backhaul the traffic from the cell back to some point of aggregation. There's wired and wireless options for backhaul. Um, this particular diagram shows what the wired options might look like. Look like. On the side of the building, we can see some small cells, and those particular uh, deployments might use the extension of in-building copper or fiber cabling to the outside of the building to take traffic from the small cell to an Ethernet router or EAD, an extensible access device. For the small cells that you see on the street poles, they could be connected to on-street cabling, and then their traffic is backhauled via an Ethernet NID, uh, a network integration device. Now let's look at the wireless backhaul options. Here we've got a range of possible solutions, all of them being variants on microwave backhaul. Firstly, there's point-to-point -point line of sight solutions that are based on traditional microwave spectrum bands from, say, 7 or 8 gigahertz around uh, up to around 42 gigahertz. Some, some uh, products go higher than that. Um, and that's closest to what we've seen as the dominant microwave backhaul solution for macro base stations. Then there's um, also point multi-point solutions, which leverage a different topology and aggregation methodology. Um, according to the vendors of those solutions, this also uh, yields different economic benefits. And this type of point multi-point solution also uses similar spectrum bands. 
But these bands are often a premium for macro backhaul, so we are seeing mobile operators evaluate options in alternative spectrum ranges. And amongst these, we see uh, non-line-of-sight solutions based on sub-6 gigahertz spectrum, which can be point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint. And then there's line-of-sight solutions based on higher frequency bands, which typically yield much higher bandwidth connections, but also very often have distance limitations. And these are in the 60 gigahertz range, uh, which is often unlicensed or lightly licensed, um, often known as E-band, um, or higher than that in the 71 to 76 and 81 to 86 gigahertz range, which are typically licensed. And we refer to those options as millimeter wave. Um, so we're seeing small cells uh, being deployed outdoors already by mobile operators, but in very modest volumes currently. Um, but because of that, the small cell backhaul market is actually starting already. It is underway, uh, even though it was only a couple of hundred million dollars of equipment revenue last year. Um, and that's obviously very small compared to the macro backhaul segment, which is far more mature. But we are seeing mobile operators testing small cells, conducting field trials, selecting technologies and products and vendors for small cell base stations and backhaul solutions. Predominantly, that's been focused on two main applications so far, in the metro areas, such as we've just described, but also uh, a secondary market in rural areas where small cells are more cost-effective, um, arguably as a means of delivering coverage compared to macro base stations. But what this momentum is going to mean is an acceleration of deployments, and that's going to inject momentum in turn into the backhaul equipment market. Um, we estimate this to grow to become a $5 billion market in total uh, for uh, small cell backhaul equipment revenues between 2012 and 2016. But the key point to make here is that every deployment will be different just as every network is different. So there's no single small cell backhaul solution that's going to be optimal in every single uh, scenario or deployment of small cells. Operators are going to need that toolkit of solutions. Just to give you a sense of that market growth, this particular chart is uh, Infonetics forecast from outdoor small cell backhaul connections. And this assumes one connection per small cell, though, of course, in equipment terms, there may be a requirement for more than one equipment unit per connection, depending on what solution is used. But obviously, the number of connections is pretty modest right now, just over 7,000 worldwide. But as mentioned, this growth is already happening. The acceleration is going to take place over the long term as small cells proliferate. And we're going to see these uh, connections grow to around 1.5 million outdoor small cell backhaul connections by 2016. But the market's only going to do this and grow to this extent if cost-effective and robust backhaul solutions are available for small cells. So that's a little bit about the environment where we're going to see these small cells uh, being deployed. That's where mobile networks are going to be transitioning towards. But of course, no network evolution is going to be straightforward. There's inherent challenges. So <clears throat> We're going to take a quick look at those. So having looked at where we need that backhaul, we need to know a little bit more about what sort of backhaul is required. And, and, and here we've got another data point from Infonetics' own research, uh, again into mobile operator strategies for small cell backhaul. In this chart, we've showing, uh, we're showing the average capacity in terms of megabit per backhaul connection in the small cell environment, to all, uh, and this is across several technologies, PDH and uh, ATM over PDH, uh, which is much more of a legacy backhaul technology, and also microwave and uh, wireline Ethernet. So this is an average overall outdoor small cells, many of which may be deployed at the end of a daisy chain, for example, uh, and, and therefore possibly have lower capacity requirements than other small cells deployed as part of a different configuration. But this represents the capacity requirement for the small cell connection before it's then aggregated back to the macro RAN and from there onto the fiber backbone. This is going to vary according to how the small cell is deployed and what backhaul is used. Um, for instance, using millimeter wave would yield notably higher than average bandwidth shown here for microwave. So 
there are variants, as we've shown in wireless backhaul, and those will yield different uh, backhaul um, capacities per, per connection. But now I'm going to bring in some of our panelists. Um, I'm going to start first with uh, Heidi Adams from Alcatel-Lucent. Um, I'm going to ask Heidi to talk about the differing small cell scenarios and the kind of backhaul challenges which need to be considered. Heidi, over to you. Hey, thank you, Richard. So certainly there's been a lot of talk in industry about backhaul being one of the largest obstacles to the adoption and rapid deployment of small cells. And with a doubt, without a doubt, small cells come with new challenges to address. So fundamentally, small cells need to be located where they can offer the most impact and that best value in terms of providing coverage and capacity to augment the macro network. And because of this, we foresee metro outdoor locations ranging from utility poles, street furniture to the sides of buildings, all of which bring new challenge in terms of how you provide backhaul access to these sites. With respect to backhaul access, the goal, of course, is to find the most economic access alternative that can meet the quality of service, the latency, the availability, the bandwidth requirements for the given mobile service at that small cell to that given site. And in practice, we do expect that non, not one solution is going to fit all for all operators. There will be a combination of different types of solutions, which might include copper, fiber, or wireless backhaul access. We also expect to see a little bit more of a range of network topologies in the backhaul. So we'll see point-to-point -point topologies, point-to-multipoint. In urban canyons, we may see daisy chain and even ring configurations where additional resiliency and capacity is required. On the scale side, we also see, expect to see some new challenges here. So from that fundamental basic question of how do you deploy and manage an order of magnitude more cell site endpoints in the network, to how to deliver sufficient and increasing bandwidth to each one of those cell sites. And of course, how to address that knock-on effect of mobile traffic demand back into the aggregation and transport networks. So to sum that up, the real challenge becomes, how do you manage small cell backhaul and keep your overall costs in check with the introduction of so much more diversity and so much more scale into the network? So with that, I'll flip over to my next slide here, which talks to the small cell site itself and the challenges here that impact that call. So once you've addressed the issues and the non, not insignificant issues of cell site acquisition right away, you now are faced with establishing a baseline equipment kit, if you will, and installation procedures for your small cell deployments. So the challenge here is that typical small cell site locations are not going to have the same controlled environment, space, or power access that you'd have available at a traditional macro site. In fact, by the time you factor in the various combinations and permutations of service availability, indoor versus outdoor deployments, AC versus DC power, power holdup requirements and backup, um, the various options for backhaul access and access topologies, and of course the need for DMARC or OAM capabilities, and timing and synchronization, you can end up with well over a dozen different equipment configurations and installation procedures for your crew to manage as part of the deployment. And we know that more complexity generally equals more time, effort, and cost for deployment, which at the end of the day could bring you close to breaking that overall business case for small cells. So how can you push towards more standardization in backhaul deployments to simplify deployment and also keep those deployment costs in check? And this is definitely a key challenge for small cell backhaul. Thanks, Heidi. That's a great overview. Um, I'm now going to pass to Martin Nuss of Vitesse to give uh, more detail on one of those challenges that you've mentioned in particular on synchronizing timing for small cell backhaul connections. Martin. Yes, uh, so small cells will uh, actually require very accurate timing, and, uh, uh, but why, why is timing actually so important? Uh, well, without accurate timing, uh, the calls will drop and coverage uh, will be bad, uh, throughput will decline, and uh, video streams will be interrupted. And what that means is that customers will be dissatisfied with the service they're getting, and operators aren't getting the return on investment they put into their network. Um, but let's discuss what's actually different with timing for small cells. Well, first, all new base stations, including all the small cells we're talking about here, replace the traditional E1, T1, TDM lines with gigabit Ethernet backhaul connections just to deal with the onslaught of data from smartphones and tablets and 
the same time keeping CapEx and OpEx in control for the operators. And Ethernet actually has no native synchronization mechanism. Second, uh, TD-LTE and LTE Advanced need phase and time synchronization in addition to frequency. So actually the legacy E1-T1 uh, synchronization would not be useful anymore anyway. And small cells typically require uh, about a microsecond time phase synchronization end-to-end. -end. And some of the future LTE Advanced modes actually require down to 500 nanosecond synchronization between neighboring cells. So last, with small cells at street level and on top of lampposts and traffic signals, um, GPS visibility actually will be very limited and there is increased and fairly widely publicized exposure to GPS jammers and, and GPS spoofing. So GPS actually is not really uh, viewed as an option for small cell synchronization either. So let me actually talk about uh, something else uh, um, that's, uh, that's important for small cells, and that's connectivity challenges. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about all the different um, access mechanisms, but uh, a lot of the outdoor small cells will actually sit on top of lampposts and traffic signs, and there aren't many lampposts with fiber connectivity, so that actually means that the majority of these small cells will have to be connected with microwave and millimeter wave, and very often there will not be actually a point-to-point -point connectivity available from each of these small cells back to a central aggregation site. So because of these real estate and connectivity challenges, uh, small cells will actually largely be connected to each other before finding a way back to a central aggregation site, possible, possibly over multiple hops. And this is actually a new challenge. And and requires networking function directly at the cell site, which wasn't required before. Okay, thank you, Martin. I'm now going to pass over to Ran Avital of Saragon, who's going to look at small cell backhaul more from a cost analysis perspective. Ran, over to you. Thank you, Richard. I, I think we are all in agreement that capacity coverage is what we are trying to solve. However, mobile operators are more concerned from the impact on their profitability. This webinar is not about means to improve ARPU or new business models or even a new emerging value chain offering such as called small sales or service. What I would like to do is introduce three disruptive network concepts relevant for our small sale backhaul discussion in my, my opinion and then work the backhaul and the frontal aspect. My peak of technology trends, and everybody has his own list, addresses the densification of the radio access network with a perceived lower total cost. So first, let's look at CRUN, also called Cloud Run, or uh, in this specific case, the distributed base station, um, a concept where we add sectors with micro or pico radio units and then use frontal to connect with the remote baseband units. This way, we add capacity with less operational overheads. Uh, second pick is uh, release 10, release 11. Uh, Martin just uh, noted the LT Advance, uh, introducing COMP, EICIC. Uh, this improves spectrum reuse efficiencies, both at the macro to macro layer and in the macro to small cell layer. And the third, uh, note the progress we see in the Wi-Fi arena with new standards, um, improving overall user experience. And this is also in the, uh, comes in the seamless authentication and in uh, sheer speed that uh, people uh, have. So when we are talking about dense small cell environment, we should expect to have the following main types. And we should also expect both back or front haul, or in short, hauling solutions. We will see the offload type, either of Wi-Fi or femtobase. It runs off net or basically on any broadband connection. The challenge is um, there are going to be lots of those. Then we have the regular small cells, these lower power cells, low cost devices integrated into the mobile network and come with all the requirements from the backhaul, including timing, capacity above 100, and latency below 10 milliseconds. Um, in addition, with the LTE Advance, as we said, we will see more of the new type, which we can refer to as the coordinated. 
with much higher requirements for timing, capacity, and latency. The distributed macro cell take small cells to a different level. Instead of deploying independent small cells, operators may drop micro or pico radio units across the street, improving the utilization of the macro site uh, overall resources. So think about it. It's instead of three or six sectors, why not 20? Without diving into the details at this stage, front row solutions need to address strict latency requirements with below 100 microseconds and capacity needs start with uh, 125 gigabits for a single sector, 2x2 two two MIMO, 10 megahertz access uh, channel, uh, and double for 20 megahertz. So with that, uh, back to you, Richard. Okay, thanks, Ron. That's great. So we've heard quite a bit about the challenges in terms of location, scale, bandwidth, networking, timing and synchronization, and cost control for deployment of small cells and small cell backhaul solutions. It could be de quite depressing, but here's the good news. There are some solutions, so we're going to hear some of those um, now. I'm going to turn, first of all, uh, back to Heidi from Alcatel-Lucent. Um, Heidi, could you tell us more about the wide and wireless options for small cell backhauls? Put, put that in context for us, please. Absolutely. So if you look across the various backhaul access alternatives today, be it DSL over copper, PON, carry reason over fiber, microwave, it's clear the solutions that work for macro cell backhaul are not necessarily going to be appropriate for small cell backhaul. Um, one area where we've seen a lot of activity and innovation towards making solutions more appropriate for small cell backhaul is in wireless backhaul. So fundamentally getting backhaul access to those locations where fiber or copper are not available or economic to deploy. Um, traditional licensed microwave solutions in that 6 to 42 gigahertz or 80 gigahertz frequency ranges which were really well suited for macro cell backhaul, generally don't quite cut it for small cell backhaul due to the size of the transceivers or antennas, um, the complexity of installing them, need for line of sight, and of course the lead time and the cost associated with obtaining spectrum. New solutions that have been coming to market over the past while include, as we discussed earlier, the sub-6 gigahertz unlicensed frequency solutions that can be used in situations where you don't have line of sight from the small cell to the aggregation point, or for situations where a point-to-multi-point -point connection can meet the service requirements for the mobile service at a lower cost point. We're also seeing very good interest and good traction for 60 gigahertz millimeter wave solutions for lightly licensed or unlicensed point-to-point -point connectivity. And these 60 gig solutions come in smaller, more unobtrusive form factors and are less susceptible, susceptible to interference, which is a frequent challenge when you're looking at other unlicensed solutions. Even within the wireless backhaul access space, we do expect to see a range of solutions and combinations of solutions in any given backhaul access. And of course, this is where end-to-end -end coordination becomes really critical to ensure um, the ease of ongoing network operations as well as to keep operational expense in check. There's a slide over to my next slide. So there's another area as well where we're seeing a lot of innovation with respect to small cell backhaul. And if I look in the area of IP and PLS-based backhaul, we see this being increasingly adopted in macro cell backhaul, especially as networks transition or prepare for the transition to LTE. We're now starting to see small cell routers that are optimized to the requirements of small cell hit the market. So why IP out to the small cell site? I know there are many who believe that small cell backhaul needs to be very basic, very low cost access, and that advanced networking may not be required out to the small cell site. The reality is, as you move towards LTE, you also need to look at addressing more stringent requirements in the backhaul network, and this is especially critical when you're looking to do um, a coverage type of deployment as opposed to a pure capacity offload. So within the backhaul, especially within LTE and LTE Advanced, you need to be able to differentiate and prioritize application traffic that could include voice versus data, packet-based timing and synchronization, and of course cell site coordination and other control traffic. You also need to be able to scale without running into traditional layer two scaling challenges. And you need to be able to set up simple, 
vast and reliable path diversity in the network to be able to provide more resiliency. So if you look at IP backhaul, it brings with it the flexibility to address these requirements. It can support any mobile service over any backhaul access, leveraging any topology. It enables you to deploy larger scale networks. And it provides a way to manage and guarantee differing traffic flows end to end in the network. So now with new small cell router devices, we have a way to bring a more common service model across both small cell and macro cell backhaul, which helps us get towards that goal of reducing overall network, backhaul network operational costs. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Ron. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Heidi. Um, I'm going to turn to, to Ran now. Uh, w we've heard that it's unlikely that traditional macro backhaul methods are going to fit for the small cell environment. Perhaps you can tell us how you think backhaul needs to evolve for this new environment. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we are all familiar with traditional backhaul topologies um, designed for LTE. First, they support all radio technologies, 2G, 3G, and obviously 4G. More than that, these networks head towards a flat all IP network concept. But for our discussion, there is also a clear hierarchy of capacity and functionality, the access backhaul part and the aggregation backhaul part. When LTE advance meets small cells, few changes occur simultaneously. With the introduction of headnets, what we might see in a single network is the following diverse uh, solutions, both in the access side and the associate hauling solution side. At the cell side, we will see supersized macro cells, small cells, and distributed cells. One comment on macro and why it's relevant for our discussion. The macro site is also our best shot for small cell aggregation. Therefore, we need to plan one gig to tail site in the city, not to mention the low latency intercell connectivity to support comp. Now, with new spectrum and new technologies, one gig is easily available with wireless solutions today. Uh, so now that I'm uh, relaxed that I solved my small cell aggregation site, let's focus on different types of small cells. As discussed, each come with a different set of requirements. For obvious reasons, we would like to use the lowest connectivity cost per scenario. With the expected quantities, this is not something we would like to overdimension. This is why we should expect a mix of different technologies. Specifically, looking at the wireless domain, and I think I mentioned it, we can see a mix of spectrum bands. Um, um, so we don't need to uh, uh, reiterate this message, but it's a sub-6, a 60 gigahertz, and then there's traditional spectrum. Each comes with its own uh, limitations and, um, and benefits. When we measure our hauling solutions, we should not only look at the obvious dimension, as, such as capacity and coverage. We should also make sure we have full control, simplified operations, and clear modernization path from where the traditional bank or network we have today um, and into the future. So that's, uh, in short, the evolution to what we call holistic headnet hauling. Uh, back to you, Steve. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Very interesting. Um, back to you now, Martin from Vitesse. Martin, you raised the issues of, of networking and timing. How are these going to be resolved? Yeah, we talked uh, earlier about uh, that small cells are often being connected in a daisy chain or in a partial mesh topology before they actually get back to central pre-aggregation or aggregation router. And that means that uh, there will be multiple connections with multiple Ethernet virtual circuits um, that actually have to be carried over that uh, uh, daisy chain connection. And each of these EVCs needs to maintain their own MEF CE 2.0 service characteristics and QoS and OEM and timing along the way and gets even more complex if you talk about third-party uh, operators running the backhaul network uh, for multiple service providers uh, at the same time. We talked to that uh, small cell backhaul and small cells in particular is, is primarily a real estate issue as well. Um, but the biggest problem here is clearly power. Uh, you want these designs to be fanless and 
because uh, small cells and their backhaul connections having to blend in with a lamp post or traffic uh, signal. Cooling fins can't be used either uh, most of the time, and so what that means is there will be uh, the need for very sophisticated networking silicon at very low power in these small cell backhaul designs. So um, um, I want to focus in the next slide a little bit back on timing, which we touched upon earlier. And uh, so luckily, um, with all these, I talked about microsecond or even 500 nanosecond timing requirements for, for uh, small cells, but luckily there's a packet network timing technology called IEEE 1588 that actually comes to the rescue here. Uh, this protocol actually timestamps synchronization packets at the grandmaster, and then the slave can calculate the, the actual time um, um, by looking at the time it received the sync frames and then the message, message exchange to calculate the path delay between master and slave. The problem here really is that the path delay through switches, routers, microwave, and DSL modems is highly variable, and some of these packet delay variations can be hundreds of microseconds, while the timing requirement is, is hundreds of nanoseconds, so that would completely destroy the accuracy of the 1588 time delivery mechanism. Uh, the solution here is actually two clock types that were def defined in the IEEE 1588 standard and now being specified in the ITU for telecom use, and namely boundary clocks and transparent clocks. These two clock types uh, timestamp and re-timestamp the sync frames at every hop of the network and therefore can eliminate any influence of packet delay variations on the accuracy of 1588. Um, in the next slide, I will actually um, show you a little bit what kind of accuracy can be achieved uh, using these transparent and boundary clock um, and, uh, the boundary clock modes and how that applies to um, uh, the small cell backhaul timing. Um, you can actually see, so this is this is, uh, these are typical values for time precision on the left that uh, per hop that we have seen customers achieve with uh, the test very time transparent clock and boundary clock technology. And you can see that you can get down to the 10 nanosecond level or, or better for fiber connected routers and switches. Um, microwave and pond links actually can be synchronized to about 100 nanoseconds as well. Well, why is that important? Well, we, we want to achieve if you want to achieve a microsecond synchronization for TDLTE or a 500 nanosecond for LTE advance, you have multiple microwave or millimeter wave hops in your small cell backhaul network. You really need to pay attention to each hop in the network and stay within these uh, time area budgets. And so there may actually be different timing requirements for uh, tighter timing requirements for switches and routers than for microwave length just to make, make up the overall timing budget. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, Ryan, I'm just going to turn back to you now and, and ask you to put small cell backhaul into perhaps a, a, a broader context alongside macro backhaul and also front haul. You mentioned that term het net hauling. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about what that means, what scenarios that might entail. Thank you, Richard. So let's look at this scary um, small phone type of table that uh, usually we have in white papers. Um, the idea here that we have different scenarios, so we need to uh, consider well the uh, cost and functionality equation. Generally speaking, higher capacity implies more expenses. And as uh, Martin just noted, stringent latency or QoS or synchronization, everything adds to the complexity and to our Bill. So regardless if it's wireless or wireless, let's take a simple example. If you need to cater a site with one gigabit of Ethernet service, it will cost you X. A 2.5 gigabit service will cost you 2X. But if you ask for dark fiber or um, dark fiber service functionality, it can cost you 10X. While frontal raises the bar with extreme capacity and latency requirements compared to backhaul, it also lowers synchronization, QoS, and security mechanism requirements. However, in total cost terms, weighing run, transport, and call, we might be able to offset the additional frontal expense by shifting some of the radio unit's connectivity to wireless frontal where dark fiber is not available, too costly, or just too time consuming to deploy. 
On the other side of the headnet continuum, you will find the offload small servers. Here we enjoy relaxed latency, QoS and synchronization requirements with higher error tolerance. However, with sub $1,000 cost targets per cell, people would expect a very cost-efficient backhaul solution, either the service or even integrated into the small cell itself. An interesting conclusion when you look at this table is no matter what is your small cell scenario of choice, we will have to deal with a rather strict requirement across the board. And if you calculate in also the deployment density, urban challenges, and the implications of zoning, it's easy to see that the new generation of optimal solutions per hauling scenario is, is a key requirement. So back to you, and thank you. Thanks very much, Ran. So we've heard about the problems inherent in small cell backhaul, and now we've also heard about some of the solutions. But how might service providers approach this environment? Heidi, I'm going to ask you, perhaps you could pick up uh, from what Rand's just described and, and talk me through how service providers might approach this. Okay, so certainly by the nature of where small cells are going to be located and the variety of ways we have to connect them into the backhaul network or to provide a backhaul service, there's certainly going to be a very wide variety of deployment models for small cell backhaul. So on this particular chart, I'm highlighting three of many, many possible deployment models. The first one illustrates one we've actually spent a fair amount of time discussing already, which is the ability to extend existing macro cell based backhaul out to the small cell, leveraging unlicensed wireless backhaul solutions. So we've heard a bit on this. I won't dwell here. The second one is interesting. It's being explored by operators who have access to existing fixed access infrastructure. So this is an interesting application as typically copper or fiber facilities will frequently be located in the high traffic areas where we expect small cells would be deployed to offload the macro. New technologies that include multi-pair bonding and vectoring can enable copper access to now be considered as a viable option for many backhaul applications. And likewise, if you go into the PON or fiber domain, GPON and EPON are also um, very viable options for small cell backhaul, and new technology has been brought to market to provide um, smaller form factor, more cost-effective optical network terminals or ONTs that can be deployed in the cell site devices to provide on-ramp into the PON infrastructure. And finally, in the third application I have on the bottom here, we do see operators who have access to dark fiber facilities in dense urban areas who are looking to leverage fiber-based SIPRI front hall to be able to bring small cell remote radio heads back to a pooled baseband site. And from here, of course, all forms of traditional backhaul can be used to get that mobile traffic from that baseband site back into the MITSO site or towards the current gateway site. Back over to you, Richard. Thanks, Heidi. So um, we're now just going to hear a, a little bit from each of our panelists on how their companies are approaching small cell backhaul. So uh, ladies first, we're going to stay with you, Heidi. Thanks. So from an Alcatel-Lucent perspective, um, we've brought together a very comprehensive mobile backhaul portfolio that includes multiple backhaul access options, leveraging leading technology in packet microwaves, fiber and copper-based backhaul access solutions as well. We also offer backhaul aggregation and transport solutions that leverage our packet optical and carrier Ethernet portfolios, as well as an overarching IP and PLS backhaul portfolio that can assure backhaul service across all of these differing underlying access, aggregation, and transport domains. All of these are managed by a common management platform for enabling more efficient operations, and we also offer a full range of professional service that can help you from backhaul planning, optimization, business case, and development and deployment. So in sum, our backhaul solutions for the heterogeneous backhaul offer for macro and small cells offer you the flexibility, scale, and simplification needed to assist mobile operators and backhaul transport providers to deliver an outstanding service experience to their mobile subscribers while really trying to minimize the backhaul network total cost of operations. Thanks, Richard. Okay, thanks, Heidi. And now to Rand to give us the Saragon perspective. Thank you. So mobile operators are going to use a mix of technologies in order to increase capacity coverage while reducing their total cost. I think there is a, 
consensus on at least on this call. Uh, the heterogeneous networks continue means that there is not going to be a single network approach for the backhaul or frontal. 3H, at least what we call 3H, holistic net hauling, is about realizing the dream of the best, net, best network possible at every point. On one side, the multi-vendor, small cells that you can work independently, low-cost type, Wi-Fi or Femto, they work either off-net or in a loosely integrated way. It's a relaxed combination of integration and coordination. You don't need all those high requirements from the backhaul, and this leads us mainly to unlicensed spectrum, low cost, low form factor, and hopefully integrated wireless solution. At the other side, there is the remote radio heads or units or RUs as they call it, uh, as a small cell alternative requiring tight integration, tight coordination, very high capacity, very low latency, and increased availability for the transport also known as frontal. So with that, um, wish you uh, a great small cell deployment uh, planning. And with that, I hand Thanks, to you. Thanks, Ran. Back. Thank you very much. And uh, now, Martin, um, what, what is Vitesse offering to this environment? Yeah, so uh, small cell backhaul obviously offers a few new challenges, one of them the necessity to perform fairly sophisticated and low-power networking functions right at the cell site, and the other one, how to deliver nanosecond accurate timing to these small cells directly over the network, since GPS is really not a viable timing technology for small cells. Uh, both of these challenges can be solved using the proper silicon technology. When we actually look at the timing problem a little closer, uh, the test has shown that with its, its uh, IEEE 1588 uh, precision timing, uh, protocol-based very time technology, fiber or copper connected switches and routers can easily achieve less than 10 to 20 nanosecond per hop accuracy. While we actually have to, to budget a little more um, for the microwave and millimeter wavelengths that will be a very common place for small cell backhaul. Um, we might actually even want to define different equipment classes in the, in the standards based on what precision range a specific equipment can achieve. That way, operators could actually have an easy way to determine if the network will meet TDLT and LT advanced timing requirements before they actually build the network. Um, the table on the right-hand side shows such an example, uh, time error budget calculation. So uh, most of all, uh, implementing transparent clocks and boundary clocks with the vision capability we talked about does not have to be difficult or costly. In most cases, all you have to do is up, actually upgrade the, the port I.O. FIES with, FIES with integrated Veritime technology, and, uh, and you're done. Uh, back to you, Richard. Okay. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, we're going to just wrap and summarize with a few concluding remarks before we go into Q&A. But just before I do that, I'm going to hand briefly back to our moderator, Scott Rainovich, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the Q&A is going to work today. Scott, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I just uh, became aware of a technical problem. Some people were having trouble viewing the Q&A screen, which is why uh, we uh, were having trouble getting some people's questions, and some people have emailed me. So if you, uh, for our audience, if you're in the presentation and you hit F5 at the top or refresh the screen, the, the Q&A screen could come up. So I just wanted to alert people of that. Uh, if you refresh or hit F5, and then you can see the Q&A screen and, and enter your, Q and your questions into the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen, uh, I will get them and I will be able to send them to our speakers. But uh, before that, um, we'll start Q&A in a few minutes. I'm going to go back to Richard, who's going to draw some conclusions from our presentation here. Great. Thanks, Scott. So there's still time to get your burning question in, so, so uh, don't, don't feel that you've lost your opportunity. You've got a, a minute or two while I run through a, a, a few final remarks. So what have we heard so far? Well, we've, we know that small cells are going to be um, deployed in new outdoor locations. They're going to be on lighting poles, utility bowls, building sites, and, and that's going to bring new challenges. It's going to require flexibility and reliability in terms of the backhaul solutions. 
There's no single technology that's going to be a, a universal solution for backhaul for small cells. So it's absolutely vital that we have a toolkit of solutions. The bandwidth demands are going to grow as we get further into the HetNet environment. Uh, the diversity of deployments and the backhaul solutions used uh, together with networks and services uh, delivered means there's going to be a clear need to manage capital and operational costs for small cell deployment and small cell backhaul. Uh, backhaul solutions are going to need to scale in terms of numbers. That's going to bring in timing and networking issues. Uh, in particular, there are special timing and synchronization constraints for TDE, uh, TDLTE and LTE advanced. Uh, those are solved uh, with 1588 version 2, um, while the use of transparent clocks is going to help reduce costs. Okay, but div despite the diversity of HetNet capacity and coverage scenarios for small cells, there, there has emerged and continues to emerge uh, a range of product and technologies that is uh, going to deliver mix and match solutions for backhaul. Those are going to work within the CapEx constraints of the small cell model, and, and so we believe, um, and, and I think the, the vendors certainly believe, that now is the time for mobile operators to start moving forward and start taking bolder steps with small cell deployment because it is a vital part of their network evolution. So thank you very much. Those are the content slides that we're covering today. I'm now going to hand back to our moderator, Scott Rainovich, who's going to navigate us through the questions and answers. Scott, back to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we've got lots of questions in, coming in now. Uh, before that, let's, um, let me go over some housekeeping items. Uh, got a lot of questions here about uh, reviewing the presentation. Uh, this same presentation will be available live on demand four hours after this ends, so later today, and then uh, that's available for 90 days. So you can use the same link to view the webinar on demand uh, whenever you want um, once that goes active four hours after this presentation. Um, also, you know, if you have any other questions, you can, of course, uh, email me at scott.rainovich at infinetics.com. Uh, I want to, you know, thank our sponsors again, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, Saragon, and Vitesse that made this possible. We have um, many more webinars coming. You can check our events page on Infinetics. It has a full calendar for the year, and uh, you can see all of the planned webinars that are uh, also available for sponsorship. So uh, with that, let me go on to the questions. Um, they are streaming in. Uh, here's here's one I thought that was interesting um, because uh, we did have a uh, we had many I noticed MSOs on the call and uh, one particular MSO asks Do MSOs have any particular challenges to be a provider for tier one carriers for small cell backhaul timing and sync challenges for example. Um, maybe uh, Martin, you were talking about timing. Do you have any feedback on that? Martin may be muted. Oh, he was. Uh, um, I was just answering one of the the other. Um, uh, say, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. We, well, we had several MSOs on the call, and I there were I noticed there were a number of MSOs asking about whether they you know are can you see any viability for them in this market? And one particular question: Can MSOs be a tier one carrier for small cell backhaul? Do you see? Yeah, absolutely. See, right. Um, I, I do see that again, primarily in the United States. The uh, uh, the, the backhaul um, environment is, is primarily, or to a large degree, a third-party operator in, environment where third-party operators are providing backhaul for multiple other uh, wireless service providers, and uh, certainly that's been the case for the MSOs as well. Um, the again, I think one of the things uh, just started talking to some of the, the MSOs and their vendors about providing uh, network timing over the, the DOCSIS network, which is uh, is actually possible. Um, I don't have any accuracy uh, results yet, but uh, it's certainly something that I would be looking at if I was an MSO. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a, another question here um, about microwave. You know, we, we heard on the webinar a little bit about the microwave 
back hall, there's also microwave front hall. And one question is, can microwave handle the capacity requirements needed for front hall applications? Um, does anybody want to take that? I will, I will default to uh, Saragon since they were speaking to microwave quite a bit. Yeah. Um, yes, it's run. Well, uh, if you look a few years ago, it looked impossible. Uh, microwave was used for uh, E1s or multiple E1s mainly. Um, SDH was a, a great innovation 10 years ago. Today we have one gig in a box, both in traditional microwave and in uh, new bands like E-bands. So, um, I believe that uh, capacity over the air is available. It's not the same technology that evolved in the access also propagated into the back home. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a number, uh, also a number of questions here on the market size. Richard, I know you gave some uh, some market sizing is always a challenge, but uh, you gave some indication of that. Um, do you have any idea how th this will Break down. I know in the first slide you had a breakdown between macro cells and, and small cells, and how the percentage will yeah. change over time. Um, yeah, well, we've we've done a number of studies at Infinetics in, in this environment, both uh, in terms of tracking equipment trends, but also doing a lot of, uh, if you like, the due diligence with operator surveys, speaking to mobile operators about their time frame for rolling out small cells, what their preferred form factors would be, what the uh, kind of technology choices uh, are looking like for backhaul, what kind of scale of deployment they're looking at, and, and so on. Um, in, in terms of um, how we've, we've really built up that forecast, we did a small cell forecast uh, initially, so we were forecasting uh, outdoor deployments of microcells, picocells, and public access femtocells. Um, a very small form factor, but we did include that as well. Um, for the, the solutions that we've spoken to predominantly today, we're looking at the micro and pico cell uh, deployments. So having built that forecast, we then looked at how that would break down in terms of the different backhaul technologies. The details are in the reports that uh, we have available, but to, to give you a, a general rule of thumb, we, we see a breakdown of around 25 to 75 split between wired and wireless backhaul solutions for small cell uh, deployment. So about 25% using those are on-street wired cabling solutions. Uh, I think Martin mentioned that they're not always going to be available. We're not always going to have copper or fiber where we need it, exactly where that small cell is going to be deployed on the street. So that is leading towards uh, you know, a, a very strong play for wireless backhaul solutions. In, in my earlier slide, I looked at those, how, those, how those different uh, wireless solutions break down. We're seeing a lot of um, interest in the unlicensed E-band in particular from mobile operators because, of course, there's some uh, spectrum benefits but also capacity benefits from uh, those higher spectrum um, solutions. Um, but, but really, you know, the message has been there's, there's got to be a toolkit of solutions. So we're seeing a, I would describe a relatively even breakdown between the traditional point-to-point -point microwave in the traditional spectrum bands um, some interest in point to multi point microwave as well, uh, a great deal of activity, certainly a lot of new vendor activity uh, in the non line of sight sub six gigahertz uh, okay. spectrum range but but probably more of a, a a dominant certainly towards the longer term in our forecast uh, in terms of uh, a bias towards the um, the millimeter wave technologies yeah, okay. You know, I also I think we have uh, Michael Howard, who's also lurking out there here on the Q&A. Michael, are you there? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> you um you you've reiterated some of the forecasts here, but I, I was just wondering if you could give some more color because these market size forecasts are always, uh, from my perspective, it's always entertaining to see the uh, the most bullish forecasts versus the 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 more realistic forecasts. Maybe you could just give us color on what you see out there in the market in terms of the range. Sure, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our forecast. So uh, certainly what we've seen and we've been tracking the macro cell backhaul equipment market for years, um, and it's kind of steadied 
out uh, at around seven billion a year, uh, and a total of five years spending from 2012 to 16 for macro sale backhaul uh, is around 44 billion dollars. So it's still a massive part, and 95 percent of that is IP Ethernet, and the biggest chunk inside of that spending on equipment is is on microwave of 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 different sorts, whether mostly micro, standard microwave, but also millimeter wave and uh, the non-line of sight sub six. So uh, we've recently done, uh, as Richard was mentioning, a lot of work, and what we've found is an additional uh, new forecast for uh, small cell backhaul outdoor, in particular, not including uh, in building backhaul, but outdoor small cell backhaul over the 2012 to 16 five-year period uh, is a, a new fresh $5 billion uh, on equipment spending. That's not the small cells themselves. It's the backhaul equipment uh, only. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to another question here. Uh, let me get Heidi from Alcatel. It's, uh, it's, it's Heidi turn. You've seen something from the customers to reflect this question. But he's asking, what types of reliability requirements are there for the different types of backhaul? For example, 50 milliseconds, is that a target value? Are you hearing anything from customers in that nature? So I think in terms of reliability, absolutely, it's, again, meeting the requirements to that particular mobile service. Um, certainly in terms of um, looking at different mechanisms for providing resiliency within the network as you move towards an IP backhaul type solution, you now have the ability to provide solutions such as fast reroute um, and others that can help you attain those um, higher levels of service restoration. So certainly, yes, we are expecting to see, especially um, in applications where it's full service coverage as opposed to capacity offload, um, that you be able to maintain those higher levels of resiliency within the network. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, we also talked a little bit about form factors, and uh, there's, there's a couple questions in here about the range of form factors you're seeing and, and how these things, kind of fascinating how these things kind of can just snap on like lampposts or trees or <laughs> you nail them to the side of your car. I, I, it's a little unclear, <clears throat> you know, what the regulations are in different municipalities, but maybe uh, somebody could answer what, what kind of um, range of the form factors you're seeing and what, what we're likely to see. Does anybody want to start with that? I'd love to take that one, Scott. If, if okay, you sure. Um, so certainly in the initial um, deployments, when you, you talk to folks, and especially when you're trying to get municipalities and such to agree to putting up these small cells, you know, in public view, and many of these will be deployed at street level, form factor becomes very important. It's got to blend into the background. Now, at the same time, it's quite interesting as we were embarking in trials and putting together on a utility pool, as an example, all the different components that you require to support a given small cell. And by the time you take into account power and power backup, um, you have to be able to get power, for example, up to your radio site and to your, and to your microwave, if that's a backhaul. Um, you could end up, we ended up in situations where we have a pool with, you know, multiple different barnacles on it, and all of a sudden it's no longer as attractive an offer. So what we are seeing as we get more experience in this market is comb combining and consolidating multiple of these functions into smaller packages that do make them easier to deploy and certainly more attractive visually um, for small cell deployments. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so <clears throat> anybody else want to address that issue, especially power, because uh, we have several questions about power. Um, including what are the recent breakthroughs and challenges that need to be addressed with power? Does maybe Ran or Martin want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, we're think... getting to the top of, of the seminar, but the uh, um, a lot of the power requirements are really uh, around, factored around sort of power over Ethernet, uh, power envelopes, either 16 watts or 22 watts, and as Heidi mentioned, uh, yeah, you need uh, um, you need to power your small cell. You need to power your your backhaul um, gateway. 
equipment and and the networking ships. So essentially, all of these are are becoming very very important. You have to really all the equipment in there, including the small cell ships, the the, uh, um, the the microwave modems, as well as the networking ICs, have to be low power to fit into this envelope. And um, only those technologies really evolving, but they're they're getting low and lower in power, and solutions are out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Well, uh, we're actually closing down the hour here, so uh, I'm going to close the session there. There were a lot of really good questions and uh, very good presentations. Again, I want to thank our sponsors, Alcatel Lucent, Saragon, and Vitesse. Uh, as a reminder, this webcast will be on demand for 90 days. You can see the whole thing again. You can see it again and again if you want. Um, and if you need more information about our events, you can always go to our events page, infinetics.com slash infinetics-events, um, and send me questions if you have any. Uh, thanks, everybody, for participating. And uh, everybody have a good day. Thank you very much.